Hello and welcome to uh, Melbourne Catholic and our various Melbourne Catholic social media ch uh, channels, including the new app. I hope you've downloaded it. Just uh, dial Melbourne Catholic at the App Store. Bishop Peter Elliott has just retired and uh, is our special guest. We're going to have a little uh, fireside chat. Bishop Peter, welcome. Thank you, Shane. Lovely to chat. Congratulations. Is that the right wordage to a bishop? Congratulations on your retirement? Well, yes and no, because a bishop's retirement is a bit like a busman's holiday. You still keep doing just about everything you were doing. So explain to people, you hit the ripe old age of 75, you're then required, are you not, to retire? Yeah, we are required when we turn 75 to send a letter of resignation to the Holy Father, the Pope. Yes and it's up to his decision. In some situations where there's a big need, uh, as happened some years ago in one of the dioceses in Australia, they let the assistant bishop, the auxiliary bishop, stay on a year or so extra. I was given an extra month to act as administrator of the archdiocese while Archbishop Commonsoli was in Rome for the great synod on youth, and then my retirement was officially accepted. So what's that going to mean in your life? Now that you are retired, are you still Bishop Peter Elliott? Oh, yes. The, the, the title bishop is that of a, a divinely given office through sacred orders, ordination. Yeah. And it's given with an indelible character. You can never lose it, like the priesthood. And so I'm always a bishop, a successor of the apostles. I don't have a diocese in the same sense that, say, the bishop of a, a big city or a big town does. And those of us who... Um, our titular bishops, we are given dioceses which are now defunct. Oh, okay. That have been closed down because of historical reasons. Therefore, I'm the bishop of Manichensa, which was uh, one of the Roman colonial dioceses in North Africa in the early centuries of the church. And then with the rise of Islam, it ceased to be a, a Catholic diocese. But every bishop who has to have a diocese of some sort. So 11 years ago, you became a regional bishop here in the Archdiocese of Melbourne. Uh, tell me about your time in that role. Well, it was a role with which I was familiar because I had been secretary to the regional bishop of the South for five years, that is from 1979 to 1984, and that was the famous Bishop John A. Kelly. Right. And I knew the region, driving him around in his car and, and answering the phone, doing his correspondence, as well as working in the parish of Mentone and at St Bede's College. So I know the area. So I was, Archbishop Hart said, you know that region, I will make you regional bishop of the south, the Mornington Peninsula, right up to Port Melbourne, around the river, Monash, Uni, Dandenong, that's my area. And as regional bishop, I saw my first challenge and duty as looking after the priests. Yes. The bishop is responsible for the priests. And I must say that's been a great work. There have been some hiccups and some problems, as is inevitable. But by and large, I'm greatly encouraged by the commitment of our priests and the hard work they carry out, especially now the number of priests is down. And a lot of people wouldn't appreciate just how much work a priest and a bishop puts in yes. uh, in any given week. Yes, it's not a nine to five job. You can't run it on office hours. Uh, the bishop's job is a bit skewed, in a, shall we say, in a different direction. Sure. A lot of the bishop's work is in the evening and at night. Well, bishops uh, have to go out and do confirmations. Mm -hmm. And the confirmations are given at the age of 11 or 12. And so we have the grade fives and six being confirmed in our schools and in catechist programs. So you get to know the parishes through the schools, through the priests, through the teachers, through the catechists, and particularly... I enjoyed the ministry of confirming our Catholic children. And confirmation is one of those great sacraments. I mean, have you got any great memories of confirmations? You must have done quite a lot in your 11 years. Well, you lose track of the, of the uh, number, of course, of confirmations. But there are certain parishes that stick in my mind. I love good music. And there's, there's a half a dozen parishes where the music is of a beautiful quality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's ethnic groups like the Samoan choirs right. are very exciting over in the Dandenong side of the region. And recently a fantastic Indonesian choir. Only yesterday at Port Melbourne I confirmed Indonesian community, young people in that community and the choir. I said as I was leaving, can I take them with me? They're so good. <laughs> so those are inspiring moments and you see also 
I believe, an improvement in religious education. The young people know a bit more than they would uh, have known when I first became a bishop. That's interesting. And that's a field in which I've been involved as editor of the religious education textbook. Sure. But the, the region as a, as a whole shows some variety ethnically and it shows some big socio-economic differences and you have to pick that up and you have to run with that, walk with that, accompany people where they are. And there are parishes with lots of little battlers in them, mm. particularly people struggling in these tough times to raise a family and pay for everything. Other parishes which are more affluent, and I must regrettably say the practice of the faith is not so good in the affluent parishes. Pope Francis asked us to get the smell of the sheep. Well, I've said to various people, there are a couple of very smart parishes in my region where the smell of the sheep is Chanel number no. 5. <laughs> so We're talking to uh, recently retired Bishop Peter Elliott. And uh, whether you're watching uh, on the new app or uh, on the Melbourne Catholic website via our Melbourne Catholic social media channels, lovely to be able to have a bit of a chat. I remember when I got confirmed, which was 1970-ish, mm -hmm. I was frightened that when the bishop gave me a bit of a tap on the face, yeah. it was going to hurt. Now, it's a long time since I've been to a confirmation. Does that still happen? Is there still <coughs> a little tap on the cheek? Well, the more traditionally minded bishops like me I love the traditions of the mm. church very much. Um, I still give the slap, but I tell them beforehand, it's just a tap. It won't be too hard. It's not a sting. But it's saying to the newly confirmed, toughen up. Our Lord wants a church not full of wimps and wusses. And we need to get that message across to our young people, in fact, to all Catholic people. These are times when we need courageous Christians with the gift of fortitude. It's a great comment, and I look at a lot of my children's friends, and they're good people, but they're what we'd call their hardcore practice of Catholicism and, you know, mm. weekly mass and things like that that, say, I grew up with, uh, has faded noticeably. Do you see uh, a generation lost, in a sense? I would never use the word lost. I'd see a, a generation or two lapsed. Various reasons. I don't think I would say, frankly, catechetics 30, 40 years ago was a terrible mess. The Catholic faith was not passed on properly. Mm. I've worked, uh, first of all, with Archbishop Pell, then with Archbishop Hart, to try and repair that yes. and to bring uh, put the beef back in the hamburger, if you like. But also, they, they've grown up in a, a society of rising affluence, materialism, uh, and uh, at many weekends, what matters is either the excursion or the football for the kids and all that stuff. So you've got a lot of people dragged away from the practice of the faith by the enticements of our society. That has to be taken into account. But what I've noticed is the main problematic groups in this regard are Anglo-Celts, Italian, those backgrounds, my own background, mm -hmm. Anglo-Celt, uh, have dropped the ball, largely dropped the ball. But when we turn to the new ethnic communities, or newer, there's a fantastic level of practice, and I can go into parishes over on one side of my region, the eastern side, and the churches are packed to the doors. And people turn up for devotions, weekday mass, they still go to confession. Um, things move as they should move. But without the practice of the sacraments, we're not a church. And we have to really grip this challenge to re-evangelise our own people. But I'm very encouraged by the Catholic youth groups, particularly as they're functioning in my own region. That's been a great encouragement to well, be with them. Well, you've actually taken me almost to what my next question was going yeah. to be, and that is, yes, we know there are challenges. The sexual abuse crisis mm, yes, has been difficult. Course, yeah. the, the, the lessening of practice has been mm. and continues to be difficult. But What's inspired you? What are the things that you finish now after 11 years and you say, oh, but there's still light in that tunnel? Well, largely the, the new breed of young Catholic lay people in the youth groups that are forming and growing and developing, and they've been quite blunt. Some of them, university students, sent a letter to the Synod, I don't know what became of it, saying they want the Catholic faith in its fullness, they want it taught properly, practiced properly. And they don't want Catholic light, as it were. They want the full bit. Yes. Uh, and then I find among the young priests, I'm very inspired by our young priests, 
um, some middle-aged and elderly clergy grumble because they're, they're not into Vatican II. Well, in fact, they are. They are into Vatican II, but their interpretation of Vatican II is what I would call classical. They see it as continuity with the whole story of the church. Therefore, they love the traditions of the church. But these young priests, if they love the traditions, okay, that's good. But as long as they look after people, and by and large, they do look after people. So they're good pastors. And I don't think, by the way, that the sex abuse crisis is the biggest crisis we've ever passed through. I think that is exaggerated. It's a serious challenge. We should stop using the word crisis. That's been handed to us by the secular media with their own agenda. It's a challenge, but I believe we're meeting it, and we're meeting it in sensible and compassionate ways. And I think that's something the Catholic Church needs to do. Yes, and, uh, we have to. Uh, and we've talked about uh, many times Catholic care is one yeah. agency oh, yeah. in the Archdiocese that is actually doing some wonderful work. Yeah, Catholic care is one of the great encouraging features of the development that's in the last few years inspired me because they take the survivors and minister to them in a holistic way, spiritually, materially, psychologically. They get them help and support in the difficult journey of being a survivor. Now, let's finish this chat at the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at, at the high and the low end. In your 11 years, one or two things that have really inspired you, either here in Melbourne or worldwide, I don't mind, and then maybe one or two things that have uh, flattened you and, you, and, and, and have knocked you around. One or two things. Well, what's inspired me, I really would believe I was a, a bishop, a relatively young bishop, we'd say, a year consecrated when we had the World Youth Day in Sydney. Yeah. I'll never forget that. That was a fantastic experience, and it has had a massive effect on the Catholic community in this country. That was one moment. And uh, there have been other high points too, particularly the sp spread of youth movements, as I've mentioned elsewhere. Where I felt a bit... Um, down, I suppose, would be, I don't think the synods on the family went well. Right. And having worked in the Vatican's Council for the Family for 10 years, um, I came out of the, the, those moments, those years recently, rather depressed, to be frank about it. I don't think they tackled the real issues and um, there were problems in the way those synods were run, and I'll be frank about it. Mm. I don't think we, sh we had to be pretending in a sort of, uh, shall we say, <laughs> propagandist line that everything is honky dory in the church. Problems do happen and the problems have to be faced, of frankly. Course. Yeah. Uh, now, here we are, 2018, November. Uh, what do you see for the next five or ten years? One, for Bishop Peter Elliott, and two, for the Catholic Church. Well, for the Catholic Church, there's the great hope of the Plenary Council. I've you hear different tunes about that. Some people are delighted at the consultation that's going on. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are very nervous about it and some people complain about it. But I think it's a time of listening and that we need a listening church, a church that listens. And that's the phase that's going to lead us into a good plenary council when it comes. But the final wrap up of the plenary council is in the hands of the bishops. Yes. It's, a, it's not a pastoral council. It's not a national pastoral congress. It's a very specific event but it will shape the future of the church. And let's face it, the Catholic Church in Australia is growing. It's mm. not shrinking. Mm. And those journalists who talk about dwindling congregations, well, I'd say, come with me, I'll show you what really happens. Because those ladies and gentlemen never set foot in church, they're speculating. But it's, 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 it, we are a growing church. And I think our problems will only help us grow as we tackle them with the grace of God and the protection of our Blessed Mother Mary. And do you enter retirement happily and joyfully or a little bit nervously? A bit nervously, to be honest. Um, be, but I do have a lot of writing interests. I'm, I'm about to publish a big altar service manual in the United States. Yeah, that's an interesting one. With Ignatius Press. It's yes. coming as a plug for it. And um, that'll be coming out in the new year, perhaps, uh, or maybe even earlier. But I'm also got a lot of other writing to do. And I'll continue to do some confirmations. And I'm already booked for special ceremonies for people who are looking for a bishop who's sort of available. <laughs> and that's always a problem with a big archdiocese like this. And one thing I must say, though, too, is I'm greatly encouraged by our new archbishop. Mm. 
really encouraged. He's the man of the moment. Each archbishop has his own gifts. Archbishop Hart had the most brilliant gifts of administration and planning, and, and he really understood a whole lot of areas brilliantly. Great insights. And now we have a different style, different generation. We have a, a, an archbishop in his early 50s who's very youthful and forward-looking. I think that he's a great blessing to us. And I can see already the effects the common solely effect, shall we say, in the Archdiocese. Well, Bishop Peter Elliott, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. Well done on 11 great years as a bishop. Good. And good luck for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Bishop Peter Elliott, retired recently, but certainly been a great part here of the wonderful Archdiocese of Melbourne.